All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, in the second session, uh, we're going to start. Before that, I would like to uh, discuss or remind you what we discussed in the last week, actually last lecture. Uh, so in the last lecture, I didn't do any special things instead of what I discussed the introduction, basic things to cybersecurity, uh, just introduction. So we discussed mainly we require uh, integrity, confidentiality, and availability of information. And then in addition to that, you need to achieve other features such as uh, digital signatures, authentication, authorization, and so on. And then I mentioned that we need to have security controls to achieve those. Uh, most of the security controls are most important security control is cryptographic controls. So I discuss roughly uh, three set of cryptographic algorithms. One is a hashing algorithm, other one is a symmetric key, and then as one is the symmetric key. I will do other session on that. I, I feel you need that uh, before I move on to the cyber security protocols. Uh, so then uh, we discuss all those security algorithms including our software controls such as username and password based on the random number what you call as security key so all the strength of security in basic security controls such as cryptographic algorithms and username password uh, depend on a security key uh, so this any security key available uh, for us uh, can be brute force so that risk we always have uh, so because of that we usually need to use a larger keys obviously you understand that when you use larger keys uh, we may have a problem of remembering them so we need to get some kind of compromise there so i show you i already showed you some websites where uh, we can reverse the hashes because when you use passwords, basically uh, those passwords are stored as hash values. So then we need to, uh, sometimes people may reverse them. So I'll discuss it later on, this hash reversing and things like that again in another lecture. Uh, so today, before I start as a continuation of the last week, I would like to show you a, a simple website where you can try the strength of the password and practice how to generate a strong password. Uh, so let me share it uh, with you. Uh, uh, this website, I, since you are online, you can all visit this website. Uh, password.caspersky.com so this is a very interesting very simple web page uh, uh, website where it shows the uh, users how to create a strong password for their kind of day-to-day uh, -day activities so for example if i use password such as one two three four five six seven eight you may see that it immediately says one second to break so there are different breaking techniques in addition to the brute force. So because of that, uh, you might see it's very uh, easily break. So if I use some mixtures of those passwords, uh, you might see it uh, take a longer time to break. So for instance, this password which I type uh, requires 12 days to break, uh, like that. Uh, I, I'm not advising you to type your password there, right uh, that uh, it's not advisable uh, they they claim that they are not recording those passwords but we never know uh, so but you can use that uh, to show the people and how we can generate a, a strong password or the strong keys for that uh, so at least i think we need to have a eight uh, eight characters in a password right now and as you know, some combinations of keys 
uh, numbers, hash values, and things like that. Uh, numbers and some special characters like that. So you might understand that unless otherwise you combine those things, uh, the pass your password or the key will be break within hours or maybe within milliseconds times. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, kind of a short reminder for you. What we discussed in the last week and we have a stop. Uh, rem remember this website, keep a bookmark on it. And then you can try it later on and share with your college, uh, colleague and then kind of uh, practice uh, generating uh, stronger keys. Because any any security, any cyber systems, when you apply it, username and the password is first security control. So in there, if you use, use password, then there are no security after that all. Right. So that's the basic thing you need to do having a strong password systems. Right. With that, uh, I will move on to the lecture today. And even in the lecture today, I will also show you some demos as some students have suggested me. On the first lecture, they would like to see some demos and things with like them. And they can do hands on, they can do the things while I'm showing the demo on their computers if they wish. Right. I'm not going fast. Right. So let's uh, back to the lecture today. As you may see, uh, so today what I would like to uh, discuss is uh, viruses and malicious codes. Uh, so when you come to viruses, uh, and the malicious codes, viruses are a small, tiny part of the domain of malicious codes. Uh, let's try to understand first what uh, what the software is. So usually, you know, in the computer science or in the cyber security or whatever, we are interact with the software system. So the main fundamental questions you can ask yourself and the others, can we trust this software? What is the guarantee we get? This software may not have any vulnerabilities. This software may not have any bugs. But what kind of guarantee you get? Usually you don't get anything. You get some set of software, uh, maybe from known companies, maybe from unknown companies. You install those software in your machines by assuming it has genuine codes but we never know it might have errors bugs or someone else may plant some bogus codes there so who knows so especially you know uh, these software is developed by the people like you and me so do you have kind of a confidence that you write the software with without having any errors no no if you are software engineers even I write a code sometimes by mistake or without uh, thinking, I might introduce some bugs or the bad lines of codes. We never know. Uh, so because of that, so main fundamental question we have is, can we trust the software? Right? So basically, we can't. The simple answer from me is we can't. So the other other fundamental question what we should ask when you have a software is that software do what they're supposed to do? So if the software is about the word processing, it should only do about the word processing. It should not collect your email addresses or other details. If a software about kind of uh, to write emails, it should not look at the other 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 tasks. So basically, what we say. Software has what we use to do what they're supposed to do. Any software which do what they are not supposed to do, we call them as the malicious software. Malicious software. So any software which is not doing what they are not supposed to do or not intend to do, so these all that software are categorized as malicious software. So the virus is only a small part of in this domain of. Malicious software. 
In addition to the viruses, uh, there are so many managers of deaths, uh, Trojan horses, logic bombs, worms, zombies, and they have different, different names. They have similarities uh, and the differences and so on. Let's in theoretically have a look what is the types of malicious software. Basically, in the in generally, we can see two types of malicious software in our life. Uh, one set of malicious software always require a host program to be live. In the other set of malicious software are independent. So when you go into the first category, so in the first category of malicious software, what we call is a trap dose. So those uh, trap doors are the softwares where basically uh, people, coders or the programmers develop uh, some logins, hidden logins, where they can enter into the program later on, enter into those servers later on and do some malicious actions. So then we can see some soft, uh, bad software called logic bombs. Uh, logic bombs are the codes uh, introduced by the software developers at the time they are writing this software uh, to do the malicious actions. For example, somebody can maybe write a code while he are developing a payroll system saying if you are, if my employee ID is not available in this system, uh, let's delete all the record. Some might may introduce such uh, malicious code uh, in their their uh, their uh, in, at the time of development. So, so if if they introduce that, then what happened? If uh, uh, yes, this employer, let's say this programmer fire fired out from the company, then his employee ID is not available, and then all the database get deleted. So then he did the what he not supposed to do. So that code, kind of similar codes are called it as logic bombs. Uh, then there's a dangerous set of other malicious software available, uh, what we call it as Trojan horses, especially people who are using pirated software, uh, get Trojan horses free of charge. Uh, normally with the pirated software like games and other things, uh, uh, bad guys, they included those Trojan horses. Trojan horses are the software included inside the malicious uh, genuine software. So when the genuine software or the real software runs, there is a Trojan horse also runs in behind. So then uh, people who are using the real software may not realize Trojan horses are inside so those Trojan horses are do so many malicious things. So for example, that might collect your credentials, such as passwords, credit card numbers, that might collect your uh, contacts, or that might use your processing power uh, to do maybe a crypto mining or some other password tracking task. Some, some might uh, store some information for hard disk. Some might use your bandwidth to send spams like that. So the instruction horses basically uh, keep silent uh, inside and keep uh, running in your computers. Uh, when you analyze number of softwares, uh, malicious softwares in the world, I will show you some statistics. Trojan horses are the highest volume. So people think in among the malicious uh, software category, viruses are the highest volume. No, the Trojan horses are the highest volume we can see most of the malicious software are the Trojan horses. The name comes from, you know, the famous Roman story from this Trojan horse, wooden horse, which I uh, used a very long time ago. Right. Then uh, we can uh, discuss our well-known friend, right, viruses. So viruses are the codes basically uh, which planted, hosted inside the uh, other programs. So when you think about the three uh, uh, malicious chaos categories which we discussed, let, let me go back to the categories. So we are in the discussing now malicious programs uh, under uh, category of need hosts. So then we discuss three categories, trash doors, logic bombs, and Trojan horses. Among these three, all those three uh, bad code or the malicious codes are not 
auto propagate that means if uh, trojan horses are included in one game that may not automatically infect it to the other game no if that game is installed by someone else he might get the trojan horses but it not spread from one horse program to the other host program no they are kind of stay with the infected software only so then the virus category is different so we have the other category under host program category called viruses so viruses are the malicious software which can auto spread so if that malicious code in the software x so they will basically search all the softwares which is not infected in your machine and then get infected uh, with with the uh, their codes so there are some viruses which works independently as well we we'll come to that later on so these are the four categories trapdoors logic bombs trojan horses and viruses are the four categories which need the host program to uh, host program to live and the there are other two types of uh, malicious software as we can see call it has worms and the zombies uh, spreading over the cyberspace so they are independent malicious codes they don't need any host program they can independently spread from one infected machine into the other similar in, uh, machines so similar machines with the machine has similar vulnerabilities so among these worms and the zombies zombies are the most dangerous most popular malicious softwares nowadays i'll discuss uh, later on in detail uh, so viruses worms and zombies all can replicate auto replicate from one to other the trapdoors logic bombs trojan horses may not replicate they stay with the code right so that is very basic introduction of the malicious software let's start discussing viruses in detail viruses always need a host program to uh, live and it infect one computer or one program and then try to spread all over the other programs so the virus code usually call it as payload so the payload is basically write to other codes uh, in the in the history to right now we can see so many viruses so those viruses usually categorized into different categories so some of these categories are not exist anymore some exist among those virus categories uh, most popular virus categories nowadays are encrypted virus polymorphic virus both are kind of same category and the macro viruses uh, when you go into the uh, polymorphic virus uh, let's discuss in detail a little bit about it uh, usually in the viruses are some malicious code as you know so if you infected in one program and then if you in, going to infect the same virus code or what you call it as payload to the other program so that program may con contain the same payload so then if the virus scanners are usually we will discuss later on as well scan the known payloads what we call it as virus signatures while they are scanning the known payload if the same code exists in the other program virus scanners identify that other program also has the virus the viruses don't want to see that virus want to spread as much as possible without detecting so that they use these what we call it as polymorphic techniques or oh, they implemented te virus techniques but they call it as polymorphic viruses uh, polymorphic viruses their virus body is different from one infection to the other infection so in order to achieve this polymorphism they use different methods one method is kind of in inserting similar operate of codes you know if you add zero to anyone or subtract zero so xo zero or if you add no operation in the assembly level all are same so instead if someone want to add zero they uh, in the other code they might say subtract zero so like that so then uh, the in, uh, final outcome is the same but the code visible in the uh, infection is the different so then the virus scanners may not understand it is the same virus so like that they might change the uh, body from one infection to the other infection randomly change that so other technique virus scanners use vi virus writers 
used for having such is called encrypted viruses. In the encrypted viruses, they carry a small encryption uh, header. So when they want to infect, they basically encrypt the code, encrypt the virus code, and write the encrypted code into the uh, next infected file. So when the next infected by file gets boots, so that consists of a small decipher routine or decryption routine. That routine will decrypt the body and then get the virus code and executes. So they encrypt their body from one, one infection to the other infection using different keys. So the body is different from one, one infection to the other. So then virus scanners get difficulties to detect them. So of course, for the encryption and decryption, they need the keys. So some viruses use the same key to do so. If so, virus scanners jobs are simple because if they find the key, they can decrypt the body and then find the what type of virus it is. Some viruses use the smart techniques uh, not to use the same key. Instead of they are using dynamic keys, using a technique what they call it as environmental key, de key generation. So they will dynamically generate keys. So using those dynamic keys, they 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 know only they, only they know how to generate these keys. So they do encryption and decryption. So for that, the virus body then is different from one infection to the other. Some viruses use asymmetric key cryptography as well uh, for their hiding their body inside. And some viruses use asymmetric key cryptography uh, to collect ransoms as well, not only hide the body, but they hide the information of the users and ask ransom to decrypt that data. So that category of virus, you know, call it as ransomware. So that is again a virus, it's a polymorphic virus and a specific type of polymorphic virus use asymmetric key cryptography, is called it as ransomware. I come to that in a minute. Right, so basically in a typical polymorphic virus, uh, nowadays available, there is a host program, small decryption header available, and then there is an encrypted virus body available. So when the host program loaded into a computer, so a decryption header will run, they somehow collect the key from the environment and manage to decrypt the body. So after they decrypt the body, they basically execute the attack on the uh, machine. Right. So in addition to those uh, typical general virus, other dangerous kind of viruses are macroviruses. Macroviruses basically infected very long time ago, you know, like in spreadsheets, is, there are uh, spreadsheets called uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, long time ago, these viruses started from that age. Uh, still, these viruses exist. So those viruses exist. Uh, with the scripting feature of document uh, types. So most of the documents uh, like uh, words or Excel, whatever, they provide the features of what they call it as macro scripting, scripting inside the document. So those scripts may execute while the document get loads. So then the scripting feature uh, uh, available, someone can write bad codes and hide into this document. So that is usually a macro virus. So some people feel uh, when they uh, use kind of word document uh, or whatever, uh, uh, sorry, but someone used the word documents or kind of spreadsheets. So they, they definitely, that uh, documents may infected with the macro viruses. So Melissa is a kind of a very old first generation of macro virus spreads a long time ago. Uh, so those kind of viruses are still available. So if uh, any uh, document viewer view the code automatically, so those macros will execute. If that document consists of a malicious code, that malicious code get let executed. So the, in, in other speaking, uh, in, other, in other angle, macro viruses are OS independent, right? Because uh, macro or this software spreadsheet or whatever is the document software may run on uh, Linux run on Windows, whatever. So it, it, it runs on any OS. This macro virus may run on any OS. So it's a kind of independent virus and because of that most dangerous kind of viruses we can see today. Um, one of the most interesting thing what I want to pay your attention is the PDF documents. Because usually we are feel PDFs are virus-free documents. 
So when you get an attachment as a PDA, we usually work on it. When you get a docx of humans or a spreadsheet as an attachment, we suspect we are not going to open it because we might think there are macro viruses there. So sometimes we may ask people, send it as PDF, so we, we trust the PDF documents. Unfortunately, these PDF documents also may contain the malicious codes. So any document which has scripting feature can consist of malicious codes. So PDF has a feature, especially Adobe provide the feature of scripting in their PDF document. So if since Adobe provides the scripting feature into the PDF document, that could consist of the malicious code. Why not? How do you detect that? So there are a very interesting set of tools available, free tools, and uh, from, from a person called DJ Stevens, some of you may know about those tools. He has uh, plenty of tools, which security tools, which we can use to achieve different, different cybersecurity aspects. So I will show his page, uh, and I will also show some of these tools where you can use to detect uh, uh, whether a PDF consists of a, a macro virus or not. Right, let me show you the uh, Stevens' webpage so you can even download these tools uh, first, and then I will show you how we could use this Stevens' tool to find it out, uh, PDF consists of uh, a malicious code or not, All right. Uh, so I will share uh, back uh, uh, the web page, this one. So this is the blog, this is Stevenson's. <coughs> you can search for this Digest Stevenson's PDF tools. As I mentioned, he has plenty of tools. One of these tools are PDF parser, other one is a PDF ID, and then there is a whole make PDF ID, this one, and then PDF parser. These two can be used to detect uh, the codes inserted into a PDF documents. And then there is another one called make PDF uh, embedded file, and so and so. Those tools can use to embed uh, uh, bad code into a PDF as well. I'm not going to do it. As I said, I, I, I am uh, delivering this list uh, in the angle of good people. So, so if you want to try the bad things, uh, it's up to you, but I advise not to do that. Uh, but I will show you how to uh, defend ourselves against such attacks. Right. So I have downloaded those tools into my computer. Uh, let me uh share my terminal now uh, this is my terminal so this is uh, this set of tools are python tools i have pdf uh, id python here i have then some pdf document as you might see here and then i have some this uh, python script this python script available so uh, from this uh, uh, stevens's web page and this faster uh, scripts available. So the first thing, if you very very simple program, very important is this uh, PDF ID. It's a, just a Python program. You can type Python and program name, or you can just uh, run this uh, script uh, on the uh, terminal like that, right? Uh, and then you can give a PDF uh, uh, document you want to test like that. Right, so I want to see whether hotel.pdf consists of a script. So I don't know whether this is malicious or not. I don't know whether that has a script or not. I just first want to in, in, uh, check whether this has a script. So I run that. It shows the all the objects embedded in the PDF document. So you see there are different types of objects which PDF has. So they listed how many these objects are available in this hotel.pdf document. So uh, the dangerous kind of object is this, JavaScript. So that is the scripts, which automatically runs in the PDF document. As you may see here in this, my test, it says one JavaScript available. That means it definitely had a code. Uh, it definitely had a code. I don't know this code is a, a malicious or bad, bad code or good code, but I can guess there is a script embedded in that. 
That means if I open this hotel.pdf, in the Adobe Viewer, that script will execute. So the other viewers, uh, sometimes the scripts are not executed. So if you use a typical uh, Unix-based PDF viewers, most of the viewers, they are not executing scripts. If so, if there is a bad script, you may not get infected. So if, especially if you open those PDF document in the Adobe Viewer, Adobe automatically execute the scripts. So that's the risk comes from, right? Now you know the ISS script. So if you are interested to see what kind of script it, it, uh, it is, so then you can use the other tool available, what we call it as PDF parser. PDF parser can parse uh, a, a, any objects available in this uh, PDF document. So what I want to parse here is a JavaScript object. So for example, I have this document called PDF, uh, uh, script, uh, Python tool called PDF parser. So I say, please uh, give me the JavaScript object, JavaScript object available in this hotel.pdf. How do you know JavaScript object available? I run, I ran the PDF file. So that shows there is a JavaScript, right? Now I want to see the script, right? So I run that, you see it's extracted the script, uh, object number seven is inside this uh, PDF document. So that is a simple JavaScript which embedded in this particular PDF document, right? So this script will basically automatically execute when I open this PDF document on the Adobe View. All right, uh, let me show, let me open this PDF now in the Adobe View. Uh, so let me go to that directory and then I will share that uh, window in a minute. Uh, so what I want to open is this uh, hotel uh, PDF uh, with the Adobe Viewer, right? Uh, so I open with the Adobe Viewer and then share the window of PDF. So there you can uh, see that. So I think uh, you see my uh, PDF document, right? Have you seen my PDF document? Yes, it's it's uh, consists of small. Maybe I will share my entire window. That's much better. Uh, entire desktop. Let me share the desktop. So then we see the right. I share the desktop. So then you see my PDF document here. So which I open this PDF document in the Adobe Viewer. Let me go from the beginning. Uh, uh, so you see that. So uh, I think you see that. So there you see there is a, a window pop, pop up. So this is a script executed automatically. So this script asks, are you going to read this document again? So maybe I say yes. So when I say yes, it says I am formatting your hard disk. Actually, it's not. Uh, so this script is embedded by myself into this PDF document. So I'm not formatting my hard disk myself. But just these are just the windows. But if it is a bad guy, they can do. If they, if they want to format your hard disk, they can do. They can put a script there to do so. So you see, this is automatically executed. So it's in, in the PDF document. So for example, this is hotel PDF. So when I open it with the Adobe Viewer, that will automatically execute. So you see the scripts which embedded in there is automatically executed. <coughs> so that is malicious, malicious, malicious scripts uh, as example. Uh, so that's what I want to show you. Uh, what I want to show you and what I want to give you a feeling that uh, even PDF documents can carry uh, macro viruses. So we, we cannot trust, even it is a PDF, right? So then you, you might ask, 
how do you kind of find? So this tool, we can find the whether PDF has the malicious code or not. In addition to that, are there any general uh, method of uh, finding uh, uh, viruses? So there's a very good website. Maybe you know about that. Well, it has virus total, virus total website. Can you go through that? So let me show, let me show. I will share that my uh, uh, window back, uh, my web browser back uh, with you. All right. So this website, virus total. So this is a very good website. If you receive some documents, uh, if you receive some documents, and you have no idea whether, whether this document consists of malicious codes or not. If you are not familiar to use uh, scripts like PDF ID, PDF parser, so what you can do is you simply upload your file uh, to this website. You can choose your file, uh, whatever. Uh, so I have some file here. Choose it and then upload it. So then when you upload that uh, file to the, this particular online website, they search uh, this file against all known virus scanners in the world, kind of. They have hundreds of virus scanners, so they scan your file against those and analyze and give you a report in a short time. So then you can get a feeling that is a clean document or has a malware on it. Uh, so you see there are, uh, it's uh, getting results from different different virus scanning vendors and then they are say uh, undetected so that means there are no virus so these are the virus scanners kind of in, in the world so they, they kind of uh, test uh, uh, my document which I uploaded against all those virus scanners so whatever the documents uploaded is kind of a clean document so, so you see, no, none of them say it has a virus. Uh, so they are analyzing it against, I think, 49 uh, scanners in the world. Uh, no more than that, no, still doing it. Uh, so then uh, shortly they will uh, give you uh, results, say, whether that is uh, clean or not. You see all the known virus scanners are in the, in the list. So they uh, test against all those. So, so that is very good website. Not only uh, uh, documents. Sometimes you know uh, websites may also consist of malicious codes. So if you have suspected website, you can give a URL of that website to this virus portal and detect that. So you see, it says clean, no no engine detector, no 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 bad things are there, uh, no virus engines inside. So it's, it's a clean document. Uh, uh, so like that you can you can search URLs uh, suspected websites and you can search other information and so on uh, related to malware and things like that so the virus total is kind of a very good website uh, where uh, you could uh, uh, use when you are fight against uh, malicious codes online malicious codes all right uh, so we can move on now. Uh, virus total. Right. So then we will discuss a little bit of how these virus get spread and how that uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, how that kind of uh, infected you and so and so. Basically, virus do different techniques to infect themselves to the program, attach to the programs. Uh, so the theoretically, we say some virus append to the host program, some virus around in it, some virus integrate the code to the program, and some virus replace entirely host program. So the most uh, easy way is uh, append it. So most of the virus basically append. So there is the original code, original source code, original program code, add the virus code, so then virus loads, and then virus will load the original codes. 
first the virus codes will load and after that the original loads. Then in <coughs> sorry, then in other techniques, virus that surrounds, that means original code is there, then it adds the virus codes on the top and to the bottom. So at the beginning, virus codes will load, then original program will load. At the time to time, virus loads <coughs> other infection codes. And then there is a technique called integrated viruses. In the integrated viruses, virus code will put it into the different places of the host program. So why they do that? So then it is uh, hard to detect by the scanners. Uh, so some viruses entirely replace the host program, then you may not do anything. So you may only load the virus code. That kind of virus are very rare. So what we can see is uh, this technique. Most of the virus commonly do this technique append to the original right any virus when you uh, when you uh, analyze their life cycle they basically have four stage life cycle so in the first stage we usually we call it as dormant phase second we call it as uh, propagation phase third we call it as triggering phase and the fourth is the execution phase so that is the virus usually in one of these phases in their life cycle so in the dormant phase means they are not doing anything. They just keep sleep in your machine. And after they keep in your machine, what they do, they study your machine. So how many executables are there? Uh, do you have internet connections? And uh, how many space is available in your machine? And like that, they just keep sleeping and analyze the host uh, uh, computer. After that, they enter into what they call it as what we call it as propagation phase. In the propagation phase, they try to infect your programs as much as possible. So they 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 in the Roman phase they analyze they know how many. Sir. Yes, sir. You may be sure. share your screen desktop, not a slide. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. Thank for uh, the mistake. I will uh, share my. A slides yeah. back. Uh, yes. Now. Got the slide? Yes, yes, yes. This slide. Okay, I will. I will go back and then uh, explain it again. Uh, so now you see the slides, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Uh, there are four techniques of uh, attaching the virus, which I discussed append surround integration and replacement and most popular method is appending appending means as i mentioned the uh, virus code will append to the top and the original program to the bottom so when the program loads first it loads the virus code so and then virus code will load the original program so then virus code can control the original program with execution plus virus do the bad things and then there is a technique called uh, 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 append uh, surrounding so that they put the part of the code to the end and the part uh, important part to the beginning and then there is a method called uh, integrating which integrate all everywhere why they want to do so then the scanners hard to detect them and some viruses entirely replace host program but most of the viruses are not doing that now so most of the viruses either do this uh, integration or either do this so these are the two two methods they are using uh, to attach their code to the host program then I was discussing uh, how, how do you uh, what are the uh, spaces what are the uh, uh, life cycle of a virus so basically in the virus uh, we have uh, three stages in the virus life cycle what you call it a dormant space, uh, dormant stage, uh, propagation stage, uh, triggering stage, and execution stage. Dormant stage, viruses are just sleeping. They don't do anything. Actually, they, they are not harming you. They do action, but they are not harming. They keep silent as sleeping, and they analyze the first machine to see whether how many files this virus get infected before, and what are the spaces available, whether internet available, and what kind of confidential data will be like that they silently analyze your computer in the dormant phase. After that, they enter into the propagation phase. 
in the propagation phase, what they do infect the files as much as possible. So that's the idea of propagation. So they check whether, first check whether uh, the executables or the programs in your machine is already infected or not. If this is by himself, then if it is not infected, they infected it. So then how the virus knows whether he is already infected. So that is a very interesting question. All the virus keep uh, s some kind of a, a signal for that. So this signal is called it as a signature of a virus. So this signature is maybe a number or maybe a sequence, pattern of execution, or maybe a pattern of communication. By looking at that, virus can understand whether he has already in that particular host program. So they have to do so. Otherwise, they, they will infect themselves into the same code and they are entering into an infinite loop. They don't want to do so. They want to infect a program if it is if their code is not there anymore. Because of that, they have to detect whether they already infected this file before. For that, they keep some marks there. So those marks are called as the virus signature. So, so the same marks used by the virus scanners to detect viruses. I'll discuss in a minute. Right. In the propagation phase, they search for the virus signature, their signature. If that signature is not seen in some files, they infected them. So like that, they uh, complete the infection. Then they go into the triggering phase, triggering phase. And then in the triggering phase, they trigger their actions. And execution, went to the final phase, what you call execution. That is damage your data or damage your computer or whatever. Right. If you see, if you feel there is a virus actually in the triggering or the execution phase. So if you kind of feel you got the virus infection, when the virus enter into the, after virus enter into the trigger, triggering or execution phase. So then you have to understand at that moment, the virus is already propagated. So that is 100% sure. So if, if you kind of feel the virus is in your computer, so at that moment, you should know you are vi this virus is entirely uh, infected in your file system. So none of the virus, as my knowledge, may not go into the execution phase before doing propagation. So they do propagation first and then go to the triggering and execution. So that is the phases of virus. Right. Now let's see what is virus signatures. Virus signatures are a very interesting uh, concept for the virus authors, bad guys, as well as virus scanners, good guys. So in the virus authors or the people who develop the virus use the signatures to identify themselves. Otherwise, their code may write on top of the same code. So then, then what happened? Uh, then, then they may overwrite themselves. The virus uh, canners, uh, viruses don't want to do that. So that they will keep some certain patterns in their code. So that is called as a virus. Okay. <coughs> right, there is a question. Is there any question? We can, we can uh, get a question if you're interested. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll move on and maybe later uh, at the end I take all the questions. Uh, right. Okay, then, uh, so then uh, th there are different signature types we can, we can, we can see. Uh, so for example, so, uh, so example, the code pattern may be used as a virus signature. Uh, then we can use as the uh, uh, execution pattern, execution pattern as a virus signature. Maybe we, we, we use kind of a hash or MD5 checksum as a virus signature. Uh, execution pattern, I mentioned that as a virus signature like that. There are several uh, transmission patterns, uh, techniques they use as the virus signatures. So virus signatures used for two things. First to detect himself by the viruses and to virus scanners, the virus signature is important because virus scanners use signatures to identify the type of the virus. Right. Uh, so then we move on to the other 
other other category uh, of malicious codes what we call it as worms worms are self-replicating malicious codes they don't need the host programs uh, sometimes there are viruses also uh, spread without host programs but most of the programs which spread without host you we usually call them as worms uh, from the beginning to right now there are different kinds of worms available uh, so i mentioned some names here uh, so uh, so among the worms so the, the first worm what we call it as morris worm infected in the internet a long time ago like 20 years ago not 20 like 40 years ago in 1988 uh, uh, no, 30, no, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, so uh, since then, there are different worms. Usually what worms do, worms find the weakness in the uh, server, maybe a web server or any other server, and using that weakness, uh, or what you call vulnerability, worms enter into that server, and then write their code into this particular server machine. So then worm execute itself from that machine, and search the internet to find the similar vulnerable servers. And then they spread the code from, to, from the infected machine into the similar vulnerable machine. Like that, they do multiple replications. So then within a short period of time, if there are millions of machines in the network, they can infect them all. That's how worms works. Uh, so nowadays, most dangerous kind of malicious softwares are called zombies or the botnets. Some of you may know about those. So, so zombies, some people call them as zombies, some people call them as bots. So those bots or the zombies works in very interesting way. So basically when you take a virus, so let's say I am a virus author, I wrote a virus and I release that, I have no control after that. So that, that virus may come back and infect my machine as well. So there are no control over the virus I created to the owner it created. But uh, when you take a zombie or the boat network, it's a different. So the zombies, are, or what you call it, boats, are the codes, malicious codes which runs on uh, different machines, infected machines in the world, which controlled by the attacker. So all those machines after this boat infected, so they are not attacking or executing their attacks on those machines. They keep silent, stay in those infected machines until someone command them. So the person who command those zombies or the network call it as a zombie network or a, a, a zombie network or a bot network. So the, the, the server which used to pass those commands are called it as command and control, command and control center, command and control center. So this through the command and control center, uh, basically attacker pass commands to the boat nets or the boats. So based on the attacker commands, boats do various bad things. What kind of bad things they do? They basically send the spams, they basically attack someone else, executed distributed denial of service attacks. So maybe they execute some crypto mining or some other, other uh, processing tasks on your machine, like that. So other difference which, can, which we can see in between virus and the boards, uh, viruses basically disturb you. They disturb your machine, they disturb your action, they try to delete your files and so and so, but Boats are not doing that. What the boats want to do is hide your machine as much as possible, as long as possible. So then you. Uh, Uh, so then uh, what's happened uh, if uh, uh, the attacker 
uh, execute those commands whatsapp on these individual boards or those zombies execute that so since attacker wants to hide these zombies so those zombies or the boards are not doing bad things so that's the other difference between virus and those zombies uh, zombies where usually talks to those uh, attack uh, via uh, uh, some central servers most of those central server are the chat servers like google hangout twitter or kind of any any web any social networking server can be used as a command and control centers so what these zombies do uh, at the uh, after infected they connect to those channels chat channels or the uh, kind of uh, tweeting tweeting threads uh, on the command and control server uh, then the attacker also joined that so then attack uh, chat with those uh, zombies so that's what happened so then you might ask how those zombies get infected there are different techniques so especially same as virus so that zombies can get infected <coughs> so, that means basically uh, uh, as an email attachment or some uh, you can use it using a usb drive or whatever these zombies can spread there uh, the most dangerous method of uh, spreading zombies are voluntary spreading so you know there are some sometimes there are terrorist groups and kind of uh, groups demanding some things over the internet so what they do they put some kind of uh, zombies and ask the people who supporting them to install those zombies so that's what we call is a voluntary distribution so this voluntary distribution is most dangerous because sometimes the, you know there are some thousands millions of supporters on some groups so then the attacker what they can do they ask their followers to install the zombies voluntary in their machines so then at some point the attacker can ask those machines they which he can control remotely to execute a denial of service attack distributed denial of service attack on the websites so then if such attack executed uh, so very hard to counter measure on because those are voluntary machines spread all over the world and those attacks coming through all over the world so then it's really hard to find it out who is the attacker and how to then it's really hard to kind of uh, mitigate these attacks right maybe i will show you some website uh, which is interesting to uh, see what kind of attacks what kind of malware uh, spreading going right now uh, so there are some sites let me see whether i go back to my browser uh, and then i think i have put some uh, bookmarks. Uh, Kaspersky has some uh, web page, uh, a cyber threat uh, real map, which shows the uh, malicious attack right now. So there are some phishing attacks, whatever attacks there. Uh, and then these are the communication. These lines shows communication with malware, uh, between malware. So uh, the Sri Lanka right now is 31st most attack country. Uh, in the world and these are the methods they collect these uh, threads when we go to the data sources so we can say uh, this Kaspersky how do they collect those information to present it to like on access there are scanners there are scanners on access scanners mail antivirus scanners they have they are softwares running all over the world from those softwares they have collect those uh, attacking information right now ongoing and then they put it into this uh, kind of world map uh, to give you a feeling uh, what's going on on this uh, right now on the cyberspace uh, what kind of bad things going on on the cyberspace so you and you can see different statistics uh, against different countries and so on uh, so for example when you go down uh, on the statistic page uh, so you can maybe uh, select a country maybe bangladesh uh, and then uh, so these are the attacks so there is a trojan horse right now uh, kind of spreading in bangladesh uh, 14 percent of kind of communication the last week is this trojan horse and then there was a virus like that 
So these are the detection in last uh, uh, last week. So you can see when you go into the last month. Uh, so this is kind of propagation again. This Trojan host kind of uh, spreading in the Bangladesh networks like that. You can get a feeling about uh, different countries and the activities whether there is a activities huge set of activities or malicious activities happening in the world right now similarly not only the kaspersky uh, uh, not only the kaspersky some other uh, this uh, they also do this attack uh, this website checkpoint you know the uh, kind of most of kind of popular firewall uh, checkpoint also has uh, the world map which shows uh, communication between malware uh, around the world so you see uh, different countries right now uh, which uh, malware is there and kind of attacks going from source to the targets uh, right now uh, in the world uh, in this last couple of minutes so by looking at that, you could get a feeling about whether your country is kind of under attack or not, or whether those attackers are interesting on your country at that moment or not. So there is something going to Malaysia, as you might see, from China to China and so on. So this is this information they are gathering from checkpoint firewalls and the checkpoint sensors. They have put it all over the world like that. So these are the kind of websites uh, live and running uh, to get you a feeling of the behaviors of malware in the world. Right, now we go back to my slides. Okay, you see. Right. So you got back my slides, right? Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. Let let let's discuss about now ransomware. You know, ransomware are the new kind of viruses uh, which uh, use uh, to collect ransom. Uh, so you know the bit bit blocker like that. There are so many other. I could remember their names as well. So many ransomware. So those ransomware, what they do? When they infect someone, they create a private key. Uh, they carry the public private key. Uh, so they use works on the symmetric key. Yeah, the virus author owner has a private key. The virus basically carry the public key. They use two techniques. One technique is they directly encrypt your files using the public key, or in the other technique, they create a symmetric key, session key, and use that session key to encrypt your data and then encrypt that session key back to the attack so then they show up a message and ask a ransom especially they are asking a ransom in the form of bitcoin right now so you have to pay them uh, using uh, bitcoin or cryptocurrency so after you pay them they will give a key to decrypt that data back so but uh, we are never sure they will give the key but you can try so so the ransomware are kind of other bad uh, uh, code of viruses uh, we have to face nowadays. Right. We can move on and now discuss a little bit of antivirus techniques. So you know, now you have a get a feeling about malicious code, what kind of malicious codes are available and their behaviors and then how do we detect them and get a feeling about how it works and so and so so now what are the techniques to overcome with those malicious software so as you know in the virus case antivirus software the common method of removing the virus antivirus softwares are nothing else like scanners searching machines so what they search for is the signatures signatures are the patterns of the viruses so then when new virus comes, it is a new pattern. It is a new signature. <coughs> because of that, we have to kind of upgrade our virus signature database regularly. Because regularly new virus, uh, new viruses comes, 
So we have to keep updating our virus signature database. So then uh, the virus uh, scanners, antivirus scanners, what they do, they basically search the signatures and if they're detected, they know that particular virus are there, then they know how to remove them. So if virus is polymorphic virus, or what you call is an encryption virus, then virus scanners has a problem. So because of that, some virus scanners, what they do, they let the virus to run to some extent in a virtual machine, in a virtual machine they are having, and then if it is encrypted virus, after some execution, virus itself will decrypt their body, then virus scanners see that. So before putting the code into a real machine, they put the code in a kind of virtual machine and then uh, detect the virus there and then remove that because most of the viruses are encrypted virus right now. So if they look directly look at it, they may not see that. So you know, this scanning job is not a simple job right now. Right. So then, say, uh, then how do you hide the virus? In 10, 15 years ago, writing a virus is a hard job, but writing a virus is a very simple job right now. But detecting the virus is a hard job now. So it's that's the problem what we are facing nowadays. So basically, virus creation is a simple task now. There are tools, there are frameworks, uh, there are generators available, a kind of virus engines available. So using those, even uh, people who don't have uh, knowledge about uh, computer science or the programming can create viruses. So on the other hand, after someone create a virus, detecting them is a hard, hard task. So that's the challenge we are facing right now. What are the countermeasures? How do we protect ourselves against virus? Basically, we never know at which time our file get infected with the virus. Because of that, always it is advisable to keep our backups, keep the backups of our important data. So then we say, please keep the backups in write-only devices. So like maybe a device which uh, only we can write, like a CD and whatever. Why we do so, why we tell so, because if you keep a backup, let's say even in a, Free drive devices, if a ransomware comes on, they might lock that. Right? If it is put it into the right only devices, if ransomware get infected in your backup, so then they cannot encrypt your backup because it's a write only. So you you your data is safe. So the other thing is maybe if you have confidential data, <coughs> you can keep encrypt that data. So if you keep encrypt that data. Especially when ransomware comes, ransomware see the encrypted data and then they cannot understand it is what kind of data it is. So like they cannot access the data to encrypt. So then before they encrypt, you encrypt it. So that's uh, the other advice I think they can do. And then you have to disable auto run features of any 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 viewer, uh, uh, mail or whatever viewers. And of course you have to install uh, antivirus software. Maybe you can have a simple personal firewall installs and like that. So most importantly, I advise you to use open source operating systems. I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to name operating systems, but I, I honestly tell I only use uh, uh, Linux or Ubuntu based machines and Mac machines in my life. And any of these machines, I never ever use a virus scanner. Till right now, I'm in this uh, information security domain over now kind of 20 years time. So I worked there. In in those 20 years, I never use a virus scan. I don't have virus scan even in this machine now. Uh, maybe someone can attack me. That's that's a different story. But I personally, by experience, I notice very less viruses in some operating systems, uh, and especially very less number of attacks in the open source software. That doesn't mean this open source software may not have viruses. Open source software has viruses. And it can, a virus, a virus can spread on the operating systems like Linux or, or, or Ubuntu. Then why we cannot see a high volume there? So there should be a reason for that. No, my, my justification, my personal justification is this. 
So usually if the software is closed source, if it has a bug, so, so first of all, we have to inform it to the owner of the software. So when you inform it to the owner of the software company, usually that company is denied that. <coughs> then if the thousand people get start informing that, so that company may say, we will look into that. So then if uh, maybe uh, 10,000 people start complaining, that company will say, say okay, we will, we will, we will uh, release the patch uh, to the security problem. So then kind of after three to six months, they will release the patch. So if you have them using the paid software from that particular company, you will receive the patch. So if you are using a pirated software, so you may not receive the patch. That means you keep remaining with this security bug. So usually bug fixing time for the closures of the commercial software is three to six months. So that time is enough for the bad guy to write a worm or write a zombie or write a virus and get a commercial advantage, right? So in the other hand, when you go into the open source software, the situation is different. So if someone see the uh, problem, someone else will automatically fix that. So then uh, so no one will wait. Uh, so they will themselves fix it. And then of course the code maintainers will push that fix and they release that fix. And then all the people get this fix. So usually within less than three months, most of the open source software, especially operating systems, bugs get fixed. <coughs> so because of that, uh, so virus or the bad guys has less time frame, very restricted time frame to work with that. So they don't want to do so. They want to get a long lifeline uh, to get more profit. So if you, so they are not interested on the open source operating system. So that's the reason. If even they interest, and if they, even they try to do a damage, the time they can do that damage is very short compared to the commercial software. That's my justification. Why the open software has less malicious codes comparing to the uh, uh, commercial software in the world. All right. So as a conclusion, what we can uh, say that basically malicious code are everywhere. We cannot say any code is trusted software. So they might have known or unknown bugs. So this battle between those bad guys and the good guys will continue. Sometimes people say antivirus software vendors are the people who are writing virus as well. We never know. And then in the cryptography, so basically we use for good purposes. However, Nowadays, people will use cryptography for bad purposes as well. So like writing ransomware. So because of that, we have to kind of live with those bad guys. We have to kind of fight against this bad software. So the, in case of viruses, so my advice is just jump out of that cycle and use kind of open source software or open source open system. Then you can have less problem comparing to the use uh, commercial operating system in the world. Uh, so if, if, if you are capable of, otherwise you have to uh, definitely if you use other operating systems, you have to use a uh, antivirus uh, up to uh, software. Just installing antivirus software is not enough. You have to keep it up to date, and then you have to use kind of some personal firewalls. And then you have to keep backups. Whichever operating system you use, you have to keep backups of those softwares. That is the most important thing. Uh, your data, actually, backup of your data, is because we never know ransomware will encrypt our hard disk or not. So we need to keep the backups of the data. And also, uh, we need to kind of uh, up to date our software, we need to patch the software. Because softwares may have bugs, companies will release the fixes until otherwise you apply the fix, so you may run in the buggy software. Because of that, you need to keep update your software all the time, all the operating systems, other softwares, you need to keep installing your updates all the time. 
otherwise you may end up with these uh, attacks or you may have to face those attacks i think that's for the moment i i did all the lecture one shot without taking questions so uh, i think there are questions typed in as uh, you may have some questions you some of you may already raise hands i i noticed uh, so we can uh, take few questions and then start uh, discussing about what we uh, discussed so far right uh, let me uh, answer a few questions already typed in uh, so for example uh, ripen is asked how to how to increase the security of the software so it's a very good question so especially in the software industry now taking measurements for that so far you know in the software industry what they do they develop the software after that they put it into the quality assurance cycle so that means uh, they after write everything they do testing so then if that testing goes fails uh, and then they inform that to the development back and then developer again fix that put it back to the testing like that so uh, security testing is after the software development so far now that change now basically most of the software companies were well, leading companies they put it the security to the life cycle of software development there are secure software development life cycles or secure software development tools available in the world right now so there are frameworks uh, so tools available now we do develop the software with security so that's the change what we have done so far to answer the question now to make this untrusted software we have into kind of trusted software in the future then if we do so all the software companies do so we may have less problems in the future uh, uh, then there is a question asking clear me a malicious program malicious program is any program which are not intended to do what they supposed to do so for example if you buy a program for word processing if they do kind of email so that is a malicious software because they are not supposed to do emailing they are not supposed to transfer your files they are word processing so whatever the software what we buy has to do what they're supposed to do any software which are not doing what they are not supposed to do consider as malicious software type of malicious software as i, as I said viruses uh, trojan horses uh, zombies boats and so many other uh, then there is a question saying payload means the size of the malicious instruction yes actually main malicious instruction is the payload payload is the size of the malicious instruction correct and then there is a question and uh, how can i get the full video of every session maybe our bangladesh friends they will share the entire video on the uh, lms after the lecture i guess uh, so then there is a question is it possible to upload lecture videos in youtube uh, that's i don't know maybe our bangladesh friends who may be hosting this course will let you know uh, then there is a question which tools is used to create virus so many tools I couldn't recommend or I couldn't discuss that as I said I don't want to do so and then there is a question is it possible to recover encrypted data attack by the ransomware uh, my simple answer is no so uh, if you because those ransomware use most uh, 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 most hardest cryptographic algorithms sometimes like AES, RSA like that algorithms they use uh, to encrypt our hard disk so it's kind of it's very hard to get them back so only ways we can pay them and get the key but we never know uh, they will give us the key or not because of that we must take the precautions we must take the precautions uh, before the attack before the attack that means keep the backups keep the backups keep the backups only write only devices so then uh, uh, you, your data is safe then there is a question if i use linux operating system how percentage attack may be okay so my experience uh, uh, i was using linux laptop as well from 2000 kind of 1999 to 2019 i am using ubuntu 
uh, in my uh, laptops. I never use a virus scanner. I never got an attack on those machines. So that doesn't mean you may not get it, but uh, very less chance. I, I personally feel is like less than 10% of the attacks on Linux based operating system. So all 90% on the commercial operating systems. So I, I explained the reason for that. You understand that, I guess. So then there is a question asking when organization is the government or federal security related and which one we prefer open source software and operating system license to reduce maximum cyber threats. So as you know, maybe you know the most uh, kind of powerful uh, cyber security and every every other weapons and everything the powerful government in most in the world right now is US. So US government use uh, SC Linux. SC Linux, maybe you heard about security and not Linux uh, for their military uh, Grade uh, requirements uh, plus uh, other high security requirements. There is the uh, Linux version called SC Linux, security and noise Linux. So that is the kind of most uh, uh, hard uh, kind of Linux based operating system which has less problems and the use in the government organization. In the typical other, not the military, in the other government is used. So I recommend uh, uh, any other Linux versions like. Debian based one or Red Hat based one, and that might be expensive for support. Maybe Debian or Ubuntu, Ubuntu operating system can reduce the cost plus get the maximum security. So, most of Sri Lankan uh, university basically we use uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu servers and Ubuntu uh, desktops, laptops in our students' labs and everywhere. We use Ubuntu, and then there is a question. Uh, good antivirus for Windows can be used. So um, I don't know actually, I, honestly speaking, I'm not using any antivirus. For me, all the antivirus are the same. So the strength in the signature, signature database. So it doesn't matter you are use Kaspersky or Norton, no, or I don't know the latest virus scanners because I'm not using the <coughs> viruses, virus scanners. So any virus scanners are fine. The most important thing is virus signature database. You have to keep update your virus signature database. If you have up to date virus signature database, then you are safe. So that's the most important thing. Then there is a question, how frequent we need to update the software patches. Frequent means whenever they release, whenever they release, because they are releasing the patch, especially commercial software releasing the patch usually after maybe three months. So maybe you heard about some people talks particular zero day attacks. Zero day attacks means the attacks which don't have any patch. So for example, if attacker realize, or bad guy realize there is a bug and still we don't have patch for that bug. So that call is as a zero day attack. So because the developers have zero day to fix the bug. So that's why we call it as zero day because the attackers, bad guys already found the hole. But the developers then have zero days to fix it. So because of that, we call as zero day attacks, right? So then soon as this developer fix that, we have to install it. So then there are no, we cannot say every day or every month like that. So always soon as this stuff, any software, inform there is a patch you need to update otherwise you are in trouble and then uh, there is a question asking last month i have seen that article which says that sometimes antivirus can be troublesome because some of them is working like viruses so how can we which one is the right antivirus? so this is very hard to answer the question because i also feel that so you are correct mihun kumar is also correct so I sometimes I even uh, get this same criticism from the conferences I notice. So some people criticize antivirus companies are the people who are creating the viruses as well. We never know. We never know. There are no evidence of obviously to prove that. <coughs> but we can guess because if there are no viruses, they don't have business. So they have to keep then putting virus uh, to the world, cyberspace, to keep 
learned. So then as a users, we have to understand, we need to jump out of that loop. So use open source operating system plus open source software. So that's my advice. And then there is a question, is there any automated way to find Trojan horses from the Ubuntu piece? So there are tools available. I could remember the name of those tools. Uh, there are tools. There are tools available. Uh, so maybe I will let you know later on. So to even you can search on Google. So using that you can find it out whether there are Trojans on the Ubuntu pieces. Or else you can use a personal firewall or install a personal firewall uh, and uh, ask to send the, your traffic through that and see whether that machine is talked to unwanted uh, servers, right? By looking at the sockets opens and the communication patterns, you can detect whether uh, you have a Trojan horses on any PC, Ubuntu or whatever, any PC. And there is a question, what are the open source operating system easily available and after sales service satisfactory. Uh, so I, uh, since I am not a commercial person, I cannot answer after sales service part. Uh, but the, so I recommend if you are a regular user, I recommend Ubuntu. I recommend Ubuntu operating system, very, very lightweight, nice operating system. We are in our university is used for now over 20 years. How can I trust software? No answer for that. No way to trust software. So the software has, always has bugs. Software industry is a very strange industry. I will discuss that later on. So uh, always software may have bugs. So uh, there are no way we can say this is a bug with software. And then there is a question, what are the requirements for public equipment? Maybe such questions are coming up. So I will give a, in the next session, I give a brief introduction to public key cryptography, hashing, and asymmetric key encryption. I will give a brief introduction, otherwise you may not be able to understand uh, the web security protocols such as TLS and things like that. So hold on, in this uh, Pradeep, I will give you, uh, uh, in the next session, I'll discuss, uh, spend some time to uh, explain the public key cryptography. In very abstract level, right? Uh, there's a question from Sami. You said that open source application system is more secure than the. So I'm confused why why bank in Nepal uses commercial software like Pumuthi is rather rather. So uh, so actually I am I am telling uh, that uh, so open source software has less patching time. Uh, uh, or it has kind of uh, open source software has less bugs uh, comparing to the commercial software. Not less bugs, fixing bugs, fixing time. Open source software has a less bugs, fixing time comparing to the commercial software. So, for example, if some bugs uh, bugs uh, found, uh, and in the commercial software may take six months to fix that, open source software may take three months to fix it. So that's what I am saying, telling them. Uh, so in the security strength wise, both has uh, problems, uh, then uh, we cannot say this one is more secure than that. So that not, that's not I am telling that. I am telling that, so the fixing time of the bug in the open source software is less. Because of that, if there is a virus or the worms, which affect that open software will disappear within three months because that Bugs it not any anymore, so that virus can live cannot live any more then. So if the uh, uh, close commercial software, it can live for six months, but if the same thing does in open source, they their lifetime is only three months. So that's what I am telling. So then, if I ask the other other, other part, that is why the bands in Nepal or any other country like to use commercial software. That is that's a completely different reason. So usually the commercial industries, they want to make someone else responsible. So that is a social thing. So for example, if you work in a company, let's say the bank, so there is a IT manager in the bank. So IT manager take the responsibility and you install the open source software and works on the bank. If something goes wrong, we never know, no, none of the software we can trust. So then the responsibility come to the IT manager. So it's the problem of his job. So they don't want to do so. 
So because of that, they always like commercial software. So they purchase the commercial software with the company. So then that particular company take the liability. So if something goes wrong, so it's, uh, this manager is not responsible, commercial software provider is responsible. So then uh, it's a problem of responsibility or problem of liability, who take the liability like that. If someone uses a open source software, if it is not purchasing from support, if we are not purchasing support from some company, no, there are nobody who take the liability if something goes wrong. Especially like banks, they don't want to <coughs> go into that situation. They want to make someone to uh, uh, grab. They want to make someone to take this library. So that's why usually the banks, they like to go for uh, commercial software. So that's my interpretation. And then there is a question, how can I understand or detect virus before executing exe files? Can't, usually can't. As I mentioned, uh, if there is a virus scanner, which knows that virus before already installed in your machine, you may detect that. Otherwise, at the time you may feel there is a virus or your machine gets infected. And then there is a question how eight character password is safer than other password. So you know any password, we can execute what we call it as brute force attack. Brute force attacks means a try all possible combinations. So if the uh, size of the password is larger, the combination we want to try is larger. So for example, if eight characters, that means uh, 18 to 8, 64 bits. So there are um, maximum patterns in there is two to the power 64. So then if someone wants to root post, they have to search all the two to the power 64. So if password is 2A, then 2 to the power 2A. So it's a, it's a, uh, the key space is larger. So if the size is larger, then larger, it's uh, hard to break, hard to brute force. In addition to brute force, there are other attacks, like what you call dictionary attacks, rainbow table attacks, and so on. So all those other attacks fail. Finally, we go into brute force. So if the brute force attacks depend on the size, so that's why we always say use large uh, uh, size over eight character password because less than eight characters, we can do brute force. We can try all possible combinations. Uh, so yeah. then, then there is a question: uh, Are the Ubuntu operating system support MS Word and other popular software? Yes, not MS Word. It has Open Office, yeah. Open Office, Open Source operating systems open source software like LibreOffice, OpenOffice, and so on. So that is compatible with MS Office as well. So even I'm, I'm connecting you with Mac, so they are using LibreOffice. I am not using Microsoft Office. So then there is a question, how could I understand the threat? Uh, is a virus or malware? And does it give us an alarm before? So actually, Virus is a subset of malware, so don't confuse. Malware is a big name, so virus is a subset. So virus, zombies, uh, worms, all are part of malware, right? So only is having an anti anti malware or anti malware malware software or antivirus software as available or a firewall. That's the only way of kind of detecting that. Then there is a question, some standard data sheets are available with different properties, attributes, announcing types of viruses according to the future. Features, <coughs> how can we differentiate what type of attack in your you know, PC or software? Uh, features, how can we differentiate what type of attack it in your uh, so basically, there are uh, uh, several types. You no know, attacks might be to your software, or to your memory, or to your hard disk, or to your kind of communication, and so on. Uh, so I am not aware of like method of differentiate. So this question from Spamila Uttan is kind of confusing. Maybe I will take it later on. And then there is a question saying, can we see your screen?
Let me see your screen. No, no. Actually, right now I'm not connecting for the Ubuntu. I'm connecting from a Mac operating system. Uh, so, 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 uh, so I will recommend to use Ubuntu because of my other laptop basically use Ubuntu. And then there is a question: Have have any tool to secure server network from? Uh, there are no single tools. So when when you move on, you might uh, see different tools. For so example, today I show you Virus Total, and I give you this uh, uh, Stevenson's toolkit like that. Uh, when you move on, we will I will introduce you more tools. So you have to use one or more of those tools uh, to secure your networks and your systems. And then, is it possible to decrypt ransomware infected files? Really hard. There are no straightforward way to decrypt the ransomware infected file. So you have to take the action before ransomware take action. Uh, then is there any way to know whether I am infected or not? Uh, usually no way. So basically, if it is a zombie in there, so hard to detect. Unless if a person firewall is installed, you may not be able to detect you on the attack. But you have the in general you should have a feeling about your computer how fast it works how fast it loads your page and uh, it's a regular behavior you should have a feeling in case that regular behavior has uh, deviations then you can guess otherwise you if you have a uh, good antivirus software installed they may tell you whether you are infected or not so these are the only two methods in which you can feel about that. What is the best way to prevent social engineering attack? So the best way to prevent social engineering attack is the awareness, education. So we have to educate the users not to get into those social engineering threats. So I have a lecture on privacy and social engineering later on uh, in this class. So I will discuss that in detail there. Then there is a question. Please explain life cycle of virus and bots. Basically, in the life cycle, I said uh, four phases dormant, uh, uh, propagation, ex uh, triggering, and execution. Dormant, propagation, triggering, and execution. The dormant means the, anal uh, the viruses basically analyze their environment. Propagation means they infect the virus, they spread their body as much as possible. Triggering means execute the attack. Execute mean damage your system. So these are the four phases. And then there is a question: As passive attack will not harm your system. Is there a chance to convert passive attack to that? Uh, we cannot say passive attack will not harm because passive attack will also harm uh, your information or it harm your uh, data because they may take your data later. Uh, later, uh, take uh, data later on. Active attack means a live ongoing attack. Passive attack means they collect the data and do something else, right? So it's, it's harm yourself. Uh, basically, passive attacks to active attack. So, uh, so what usually happens is attackers do passive attacks to collect or get the knowledge about your environment. Then later on, they might do an active attack. So this passive attack may not directly transfer to the active, but usually attackers do passive attacks to get to know about your information system, system or the, your cyber system. Then based on this information they collected, they will execute active attacks later on. That usually happens. And then there is a question, in which category does malware, spyware, adware, uh, is it in the worms or the virus? Uh, basically, uh, malware is the main category. All the spyware, adware, worms, virus are under that. A subset of those. Uh, so spyware, adware, those things I uh, discuss under email security. Uh, lecture where I discuss. So those also the malware. Uh, they are also malware. Malicious software. <coughs> in general. Malaysia software is the general name. So, spyware, which do spying your computer. Adware will spread ads. And worms, viruses we discussed today. All are Malaysia software. And then there is the question, is there any guideline for software developers to make in the code? Yes, there are 
so secure software development guidelines so i will maybe share you later on when i move on on the lecture those secure software development guidelines so uh, so under these guidelines and the frameworks uh, people have developed uh, uh, people now developing their software then there is a question can an organization keep penetration tester what would be his qualification so in the pen testing, uh, so that uh, that different. There are no 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 specific answer for that. That different whether uh, uh, your company size, your product uh, uh, risk, and things like that. We have to uh, decide uh, whether to keep the pen test or not, and his qualification. That's really different. There are no straight answer for that. Then it ties a question to what extent does Windows Defender make the safer home virus? Uh, so I cannot, I, I, I'm not familiar with this Windows Defender and then Windows operating system, so I cannot kind of uh, comment on that, unfortunately. Okay, uh, so uh, any any other questions? So I think, uh, so if you want to ask. So I have answered like, uh, okay, there is another question. Uh, please also share the guideline for network administrator for taking measures to prevent attack. Okay, okay, well, uh, when I move on, I will uh, provide you few guidelines. Uh, and I will have a lecture on network security as well. So in this course, uh, so I will give you some basic guidelines where uh, uh, network administrator should follow. Any other questions or anything you want to ask? So I think we have kind of uh, questions. Uh, so many we got uh, thirty-six, right? Some questions. Yes, thirty-six questions. Thirty-six questions. I will answer them. Uh, so, uh, anything else you want to ask before we wrap up this uh, session, or any comments, or you? So what I would like to uh, know whether when I do the demonstration, whether you get it correctly, I, 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 because I, I can't see which I demonstrate, how you see it in the end. I can't see, I want to know whether you got it properly or not. So like once I miss the slides like that, I miss, miss I share the wrong thing. Like that, my things may occur in that situation, please interrupt immediately and let me know. Because I I, I, I I may not see what you see in this my end. Uh, so there was a, a question uh, so how will we kind of evaluate this course? So we are still thinking about how to evaluate it. So I might give you some practical sheets, or I might give you some online exam like that to evaluate the course. So uh, at the middle of the course, I will let you know the methods we use to evaluate that. Okay. Everybody happy with the lesson? Then uh, let's stop for the day. And then we will meet back on next Tuesday, 16th, right? Uh, 11 o'clock Bangladesh time, right? Yes. Uh, thank you very much then. So I'll stop the session for the day and I will do the next session on 
16th Tuesday, 11 o'clock Bangladesh time. Thank you. Bye for now. Okay, so thank you so much, sir. Bye. <coughs>